Welcome to Second Take, the show that focuses on the issues behind the news. Legislation is being prepared to begin overhauling South Africa's corruption-prone public procurement system. Terence Krimo joins me to discuss what some of these changes might look like. Hi, Terence. Hi. Now, what is the background to the public procurement bill? Well, I think, as you said in your intro, um, it's about corruption, really. It's become really a place where most of the corruption in South Africa takes place, whether it's around um, COVID uh, mm -hmm. equipment or whether it's around locomotives for Transnet or boilers for Eskom. This is where most of the corrupt actors have penetrated. So this came to the fore very much during the Zonda Commission of Inquiry, um, where there are a number of days of hearings into the system and recommendations were made. And in parallel, the Treasury was already working on plans for updating and modernizing South Africa's procurement system. And uh, so it's a confluence of factors. There was a view uh, that it's really not working. It's not delivering mm. value for money for the, the departments that are buying it. Uh, it's become very open and prone to corruption. And then there were these recommendations that the, the president then responded to around uh, the Zonda Commission and uh, there was assurances given that the updates would be made. So that's really the background and our legislation or draft legislation has been prepared. Now it seems that there will be a shift from a one-size-fits-all approach. Yeah, you know, that's the great irony of South Africa's procurement system as it is, as it stands. Everything goes through a competitive tender process uh, that, and that's really driven from a constitutional uh, uh, clause that we have to have this open, competitive, fair processes, transparent processes, but it's become anything but, ironically. So we do these competitive tenders, whether it's for pencils and pens or paper or laptops, and government ends up paying a price, sometimes three or four or more times, what you could going down to the shop and buying it at a retail store. So it's, it's having the opposite effect. And then at the larger scale, uh, that, that competitive process the sort of people that are trying to do it by the book find all sorts of hurdles to get through the system because it's a highly bureaucratic, highly cumbersome box ticking exercise and you have to have all your ducks in a row. And those that somehow find a way to navigate around it, the bad actors, are the ones that are getting some of these tenders and then overcharging for them. There was limited scope in differentiating between buying a pen or a pencil and buying a boiler, for instance, or a locomotive. And we know those are quite different, and all uh, roads and infrastructure, uh, power lines. So to have greater differentiation uh, between those sort of routine mm -hmm. procurement uh, items and big ticket items that, are, uh, you know, that can have an element of a user pay, for instance, in it, uh, that can uh, or have a, a multi-generational life span and needing to embed maintenance into that. So you can see having a, an undifferentiated approach is, is problematic. The constitution uh, demands that we try and use procurement as a social transformation lever and sometimes that's been used I think by bad actors but it also hasn't been very very effective so we've had a very narrow base of empowerment around this even though we talk about broad-based black economic mm -hmm. empowerment it hasn't really worked in effect so on a number of fronts, uh, it's problematic. And then there's very limited automation in the system. When things happen around Tembisa Hospital and, and things like that, no red flags come up mm. in the system. It's, a, it's not, you know, so people are gaming the system, they're staying below certain thresholds, etc. It, it, it just doesn't come up. It, uh, these should be more automated. It should be, there should be greater visibility. There's a, sometimes an over-centralization and, and sometimes, a, you know, a to federalist <laughs> approach to this uh, procurement. So on so many fronts, I think the procurement system is just, the Treasury admits is just not working, particularly on the value for money front. And having a one size fits all, whether it's around preferential procurement, and we know that went to court and it was found to be unconstitutional. So we're in a sort of lacuna period now in terms of how we're managing preferential procurement. All the weightings that we give for instance, uh, between price uh, and social economic development, those have been very, very tightly codified and yet they haven't delivered. So on so many levels, uh, we need modernization, we need overhaul, we need more automation, 
we need more technology, but we also need to be able to do this in a way where the guardrails are very clear and that uh, it's, it's, it's not so opaque and complex uh, in, because in complexity is, is where the sort of the ethical dilemmas come in often, uh, where there's sort of gray areas and loopholes that can be developed. So uh, guardrails, some f greater flexibility ironically, but uh, greater uh, ethics around procurement as well. Now, when will a government consider the proposed legislation? Well, I think that uh, there's some frustration amongst parliamentarians that the bill's still in draft form. It's still with the state legal advisor. In fact, there was a lot of unhappiness about a presentation being made to parliament this week without the bill having been formally tabled and gone through the state law advisor. But I think that process is going to happen quite quickly now. And we should have the bill tabled and that the parliamentary hearing process uh, start uh, happening quite soon now. And uh, I think that the aim is to try to get it through this current parliament before the elections next year. And lastly, when will the changes uh, start to be felt? Well, that's the other thing. This is really the end of the beginning to have this new framework. It's not the end because uh, what will come is they will have a sort of the overarching framework. And I think a key to this overarching framework will be an emphasis on value for money over all else and that we really haven't been getting and that actually the, the so-called beneficiaries of, of procurement, whether it's in the schooling system, whether it's in the healthcare system, whether it's on the roads, whether it's in water, need to have affordable prices and that really requires that we procure for value for money. So that's going to be the overarching theme. But to get to that point, we're going to have a new framework, a modernized framework, but we're going to need subordinate regulation and that subordinate regulation then needs to be implemented in the real world. And they're going to be legal cases, no doubt. I mean, already it's a highly contested area, but they're going to be, there's going to have to be legal precedent mm -hmm. that arises. So I think we're really at the beginning of a long process of cleaning up our procurement system. It's much overdue and they're going to be mistakes, I suppose, and we're going to learn by doing. Uh, and hopefully the media and the courts continue to play their sort of spotlighting role on on the bad actors and the corruption. But we really, at the start of a journey, not anywhere near the end, but we really, if we don't clean up this procurement system, I think it's a, it's a road to nowhere. Thanks for speaking with us, Terence. Pleasure. That's it for today. Join us again next week for more news analysis. To subscribe to Crema Media's Engineering News and Mining Weekly, please email subscriptions at cremamedia.ca.za.